Well, good morning. <clears throat> this morning we're going to break from our study in the book of Romans. We've been in it for a couple years, and we're going to pull out and just stare in the face of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it because it's the power of God to bring you into the realm of salvation. And so we will look at that this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Paul said, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you are also saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. And we celebrate this morning that he's appeared to us and revealed himself and now dwells within us by his Holy Spirit. So let's go to our God and pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this morning. I thank you for the joy that we gather with, God, that there is an empty tomb which tells us there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. And so I pray now by your spirit that you would teach us from your word and that we would understand the fullness of what this means. And so God, meet us here, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Isaiah 53, if you'll turn there. This book was written by the prophet Isaiah. It was written 750 years before Jesus was actually born into the world. And it tells us some pretty amazing things and specific details about Jesus. It, it, this is about three times longer than the history of, of America being settled. So 750 years, and it's going to tell us in specifics of what Christ would come and do when he came to this earth. Things like Isaiah 7, 14, where we're told a virgin will conceive a child and his name is going to be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Later in chapter 9, he says, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace, and there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Then this morning, as Greg already read, we got some very specific details about the death that Jesus Christ would die when he came, and also some details about his resurrection that we will look at this morning for the salvation that he brought into the world. So pretty breathtaking to me, 750 years before, to give us the specifics about what would happen when Christ came into the world. So before we begin, I, I want to set the context. I want to set the reason for Isaiah 53. And it just happens that the reason for this, it, it's the reason for the whole world, why you exist, why the world exists, where it's moving. It gives you the answer to everything. And so... We're going to open it up this morning, and some of you just are amusing your friends, and you came to church because they promised you a honey-baked ham afterwards, and those cheesy potatoes, and I just want you, I did that. I, that happened to me, and I can tell you this, God can turn ham into eternity, and he can change your life, your destination, and so welcome. I'm glad to have everybody who's come here this morning. So here it is. Some amazing things are being harmonized in this verse, look with me in verse 10, if you'd pull that up. In verse 10, we're told the Lord Yahweh was pleased to crush him, his son. And so I just need some help here this morning. We, we, we call Good Friday the most gruesome thing that's ever taken place. The crucifixion, as Brian described so well on Friday night, was so gory and brutal and awful. It was a long, drawn-out, horrific way to die. It was used by the Roman government as capital punishment. Jesus' was the worst of any. 
trial, the mockery, the beatings, all that he went through. Isaiah 52, 14 says his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and forsaken, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. And our griefs he bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through on that cross for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. And so it was an absolutely awful, hideous death. And then you think of the one who was being crucified. In Isaiah 42, 1, Isaiah wrote, Behold, this is of God, my servant, of whom I uphold, my chosen one. And God the Father says, In whom my soul delights. I, I, I delight in my son and, and his beauty and all that he is. And so the, the best son ever is Jesus Christ. And that's the one hanging on this cross. At his baptism, the father said, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. In the Proverbs, it says he was daily my delight. So there's this great delight in his son. And then he's pleased to crush him with this awful crucifixion and all that we've been studying. I read that the Lord was pleased to put him to grief, to crush. In the Hebrew, it's in the, what's called the intensive stem, and it literally means to shatter to pieces. The grief was extreme sorrow and pain. And so the Father's pleased to shatter him to pieces and bring him to extreme pain. That just takes your breath away. God is pleased to shatter his own son and put him to extreme sorrow and hurl intense pain upon his son who is the servant in this verse. And then verse 11, it says the son will look at it and he'll be satisfied. He's going to look at all that he has to go through and accomplish for our salvation. He looks at it and says, I'm satisfied. And that's where we got to step back this morning and say, why? Why? How does a father who loved his son infinitely, whose son was perfect, he said, I always do the things that are pleasing to my father. He said he's the radiance of God's glory. How is he pleased with the horrors of what happened on Calvary upon that cross and all that led up to it? A whole world came against the son to destroy him. And the biggest, hardest blow came from his own Father, whom he loved, who poured out his full wrath to where he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The distress of soul caused him to sweat blood in the garden of Gethsemane, just the anticipation of it. And now Isaiah says the Lord was pleased to crush him. What's wrong with this father? And I want to show you this morning what is right with this father and how glorious this is. Guys, this is the whole Bible in a nutshell that we're going to try to look at. This is what it's all about. And you got to get an answer for this or it'll never make sense. And you'll never be transformed and changed and saved. And so I want you to understand what's going on in this verse. So I want to start with a big picture and the context. Because we have some other things that God delights in. Some other things that God takes pleasure in. And the one, he says, the reason he created everything was for his own glory, to put himself, the best thing in the universe, on display for the good of us, to see the fullness of who he is and the brilliance and the beauty of our God. He delights in his glory. He acts for his glory. And then secondly, we're also told that he loves his children. He loves, uh, he says he delights over them. He, he rejoices, he sings over them. He, he loves his children. And then thirdly, he loves his son supremely, and all three are in this passage this morning. So as we begin, I'm going to go back to creation in Genesis. You were made by God, and we are different than anything else in creation. We were made in the image of God. We were made to, to know him and to have a relationship and fellowship. Trees don't fellowship with God. You're special. You're image bearers of God, and you were made for him to find your joy and your delight and glory in him all of his perfections. And then the fall comes through Adam. And the fall did so much harm. It went from God being our glory, our center, our praise, 
to now we, we worship ourselves and we worship created things. And we spend all of our days mostly just wanting ourselves to be praised and worshiped and adored by this world. We're so broken. We went from God being everything to us now being everything. That's what the fall did to humanity. It separated us from God. And in verse 6 of Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. We, we've just gone away from God and we go to our own ways of what we think and how we think to get right with God. <clears throat> Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the great sin of the universe is that we were made to worship God and we don't. We glory in things other than him and we suppress his glory and his beauty and his truth. The great crime of Denver this morning is that we're worshiping everything other than God. We treat God as if he's nothing. And yet God has these created ones that he wants to bless and rejoice over them and have fellowship with them. To have relationship unhindered for all of eternity. To enjoy him supremely. And they despise and they hate his glory and they sin against it daily among who I was foremost. So can't God just forgive them? Just forgive them. Forgive them that they've done this to you, God. Just let bygones be bygones. Surely God is big enough to get over us treating his glory like it's nothing. Can't he just sweep it under the rug? And that's the history of humanity. Everybody's hoping that God can just act like it didn't happen. Woo, I can't hear you. The problem is if he does that, he'll violate himself. He's, he's too just. He has to do what's right. And to do what's right is he has to punish sin, this belittling of God by his creation. This would say that God's glory is just small and it doesn't matter and it's not important and it's not a big deal. It is a big deal and it is a big deal to God. Sin is a big deal. And it has separated you from God. And it's brought his displeasure Upon you, Jesus Christ in John 3 said, the wrath of God is abiding upon you. The displeasure of God because of our sin and our separation and our continuing of belittling God on a daily basis. And so this morning, I want to tell you, how do we resolve this big problem? And I want you to hear this. What goes on in our land daily is most are working hard to try to fix it. You're trying to be the best version you can possibly be of you. A little religion never hurt no one. It sure does. You can ignore it. And my favorite is to come up with your own ideas. Well, I think God's going to do it this way. We're going to bank our whole eternity on what I think. I want you to pray over, what do we do with this? I want to give you God's answer to this problem this morning in Isaiah 53. And the answer is, it pleased the Lord to crush his own son on Calvary's tree. The place where God's glory is seen as infinitely valuable is on the cross. And sin is seen for what it is as the Son of God is hanging on the cross for these sins. And this is where we see the love of God like no other place is Jesus willfully hanging on that cross for our sin and how we can now be loved by God and rejoiced over by him. This is the cross. This is the beauty of what comes there. And there's a way, and I want to show you this morning, how could the father be pleased to treat his own son like that? Because the answer is astounding. It's taken my life. And if you'll look with me in verse 10. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if... He would render himself as a guilt offering. And so God dishonoring sin cannot be swept under the rug. It can't be, I hope my good deeds outweigh the bad. Surely he's big enough to get over what I've done in my life. It just can't be ignored. And so it matters that you've treated God as if he's nothing and sinned against him and his desires for us as his creatures. We've suppressed him. We look at creation and we don't want this God and we've suppressed him. 
We put them out of our thinking, Romans 1 says. I don't even want to think about them. I want to think about prospering in this American dream. It matters. Justice of God says the soul that sins must die. You can't hope in God not being just. He's got to punish sin. You are a criminal against God. You've stole his glory and you've sinned against him. And so God's justice has to punish sin. So if our sin cannot be swept under the rug by God or ignored, what do you do with it? What do you do with your sin? And if you're a holy, just God, it has to be punished. That is what hell is, where people go to pay the penalty for their sin against God for all of eternity. That's why there's a hell. But I want to tell you this morning why there's a heaven. If the son would render himself a guilt offering. What's a guilt offering? It was laid out to Moses in Sinai when God gave him the law. In Leviticus, it's recorded for us. If you broke God's law, a sacrifice was made to satisfy God's broken law. And this guilt offering was offered to God and it would atone for the sin that was done against the creator. And in a burnt offering, the whole thing was consumed. There were some offerings, they left the meat and they gave them to the priests, but a a guilt offering was consumed. The fire consumed the offering because it was a type of him who was to come, Jesus Christ, the one who would be consumed. And the Bible here in verse 10 says, if Jesus would render himself a burnt offering, the Hebrew word for himself here is his soul. And it means the totality of his being. If Jesus would give all of himself, his complete self, to to be a guilt offering for my sin just brings praise to God. And guilt offerings, I want you to catch this, they were animals. And you brought lambs and bulls and goats. But this day, the truest high priest, Jesus, would not bring an animal for the burnt offering. He brings himself to be the offering, to be crushed and put to grief, consumed by the Father's wrath for sin. He was the substitute, and he was consumed for our sin, and he was willing. It says that if if you would give yourself to be this, Jesus left glory knowing every detail of what it would cost, and he said, I'm a lamb, I'm willing, I will go and I'll give my life to render it as a guilt offering so that the sins of your people could be forgiven. But Jesus was perfect. (laughs) Why does he need to be a guilt offering? He doesn't have sin. Well, whose sin then is he offering himself up on that cross for? This is the most important question ever. Whose sin is Jesus dying for on the cross? And the Bible makes it very clear. He had none. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is hanging on a cross, bearing the wrath of God for sin, It's not his. Whose sin? And I just want to make sure you do not miss this. In Isaiah verse 4, it says, Surely our griefs he himself bore. Our sorrows he carried. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging we are healed. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And verse 8, the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Verse 11, he will bear their iniquities. And verse 12, he bore the sin of many. Ten times in this little passage, he died for our sin. Not his own, but yours Everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. His bride, all throughout history, who will believe upon the Son of God and what he did in dying for our sin and being raised so that we could be justified before God. Please hear this. This is what pleased the Father and the Son. This is the heart of Christianity. You're staring at it this morning. God the Father was pleased to crush his Son on that cross God the Son was pleased to die on that cross and be marred beyond recognition and consumed in the wrath of God. Why? 
nails could not hold him on that tree. Something greater held Jesus on that tree, and it was his love to the Father and the children that he delighted in. This is the remedy for God belittling sin and despising the glory of God and transgressing his law on a daily basis. God was pleased to crush his own son so he wouldn't have to crush you. Three hours upon that cross, he bore what we could never bear for all of eternity in hell. He bore it on his body on the cross for my transgression. And so I want you to see the majesty this morning of the atonement of Jesus dying on the cross. Isaiah tells us four benefits that were won by Jesus by this act, what he won for himself. In Hebrews 12, we're told that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him And Isaiah is now going to show us some of those joys that were set before him. So look with me back in verse 10. If he would, God was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering and he will see his offspring. He would see his offspring. In that day that Isaiah wrote this, not so much in our culture, except here at Southside Bible Church, they had big families. They had large (laughs) posterity. And so to get old, you would look out at your large family and generations of abundant and great heritage. And Jesus, Jesus was going to have this posterity, this offspring. When he was arrested, all of his disciples ran away. He would go the wine press alone. He had no posterity. He's all alone. But Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And it will bring salvation to the nations to come in to this salvation that Jesus has brought. In Revelation, John gets a vision into heaven. And he sees all the redeemed people. And he says, it's so great. You can't even number them. You can't count them from every tribe, tongue, and nation from the ends of the earth. The salvation is spreading and going all over the universe. Jesus would receive a spiritual offspring from his seed, from his death. And so if you are a Christian, you are an offspring of the cross this morning. He purchased your pardon. He paid your debt. Do you realize this morning, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were part of the joy that was set before him when he went up on that cross, a bride that he gave his life for as he bore that. I pray that you marvel as a group gathers all around the world today to worship a risen Christ. And you by faith are part of the people of God, his tribe, his family, his posterity. Third, or second, we don't want to skip one. He conquered death and he inaugurated eternal life. We are told that he's going to see a great offspring. But in verse 8 and 9, he says he died. He's put in a tomb. Again and again, he died. He died. How do dead people see their offspring? Because he was laid in a tomb, and three days later, Mary and the two other apostles went down to it, and there's an angel and says he's risen, just as he said. 750 years before the father would crush the son, he says he will rise. And it says in our verse, he will prolong his days. Isaiah called him the father of eternity. By the resurrection from the dead, David will sit on his throne and his kingdom will have no end. So here is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as the resurrected Christ, in verse 10, we're told that he'll save sinners. And the good pleasure of the Lord then will prosper in his hand. And God's love of his glory and his love of us just climaxes on the cross. And now he can be just punish our sin and adopt us and bring us into the family of God. What is his good pleasure? Look with me in verse 11. In verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and he'll be satisfied because the father was glorified and there's a redeemed people now. By his knowledge, the righteous one, Jesus, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquity. He will take your sin and he'll remove it as far as the east is from the west. God says, I throw it behind my back. I bury it in the deepest sea. I'll remember it no more in Hebrews. 
and I will bring about justification where you will now be declared not guilty before the God of the universe for all the sin that we have done since we've been born and what we inherited from Adam. What is justification? It's to be declared in a courtroom that you're not guilty. You come before the God of the universe, God, and he says you're not guilty, you can go free. He justifies you. You are not guilty before God because of the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus, by his death, will do this for sinners. By believing in him, you are not guilty before God for all of your sin. How? By his death and by his resurrection, he accomplished what, divided, what delighted the Father and what delighted himself, the salvation of sinners. That's why God was pleased to crush his own son, and that's why Jesus was pleased to go up on that cross. Now he can be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. His glory and your forgiveness, Mary, on the cross. The Father is so beautiful and glorious that he would pierce his own son through for our transgressions. And he loved us so much that he would pierce his own son through for our transgressions. And everything climaxes in the cross of Christ. In verse 11. Jesus will look on this and be satisfied. And so Bethlehem to the Calvary Road to Gethsemane, he had no regret to bring you to a right standing before God. Every time this gospel is preached and you believe, he's just satisfied. Every time someone will believe in his work and be saved, satisfied. When one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. Amazing. He said, I came to save sinners, and I stand here as foremost. He came to die for our sins and to remove them as far as the east is from the west so that God could justify us and bring us into his family and enjoy him forever. And lastly, in verse 12, we get to enjoy all the spoils of his victory. Therefore, I will allot him, Jesus, a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Isaiah now moves to a battlefield and, and where a great war was waged and, and won on the cross. And in their day, an emperor would bestow on the winning general the largest of the spoils. And Jesus will get a portion with the many, the great. The one in Isaiah 53 single-handedly won the battle by his death. And all the spoils are his from this victory. And what's he going to do with them? He's going to divide the booty with the strong, which means numerous in the Hebrew. He's going he's to give it to us. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Stop, God. You just keep pouring out blessing upon blessing. Here you go. He'll share all the spoils that he won from this battle to everyone who belongs to him by faith. And so hear this believer in Christ. One day you're going to share with Christ all the spoils that he won at the atonement. And we have some great benefits now like justified. But the best are yet to come. And you're going to enter into this great eternal celebration. And people who only deserve to be damned We'll divide the spoils with Christ that he won when he poured out his life for us and he was numbered with the transgressors. All that he won at the cross will be shared with us for all of eternity. We are joint heirs with Christ. And so he is the fount of every blessing. It is the work of Jesus Christ. And Isaiah 53 is one of the most beautiful pictures of the cross and the resurrection. And he was numbered with us it means that he was treated as if he had done all that we had done. He became guilty of every sin that Ken Murphy ever committed. And he was punished as if he had done it. And if you will believe this morning in the work of Jesus Christ, you will be treated as if you've done all the things that he has done by being a perfect son and by dying for our sins. John Stott said, this is Easter. Sin is you and me substituting ourselves for God. 
putting ourselves where only he deserves to be. Glory, worship, focused, love, just everything about me. And God substituting himself for us by putting himself where only we should be, hanging on a cross, going into a grave, dying for the wages of sin. And this is so beautiful. Portrait painted 750 years before Jesus was incarnated on this earth as a baby. And he died in a, on a cross for our sins. And he was raised so that we could be justified before God, not guilty, and brought into the family, loved and accepted. So I want to bring it full circle and we'll close out. There's the delight of the Father to crush the Son, and there's the delight of the Son to go up on that cross for Father's glory and for us. And I just, there's one last delight that needs to finish out the picture this morning. It needs to be our delight as well to join the Trinity and being satisfied and delighted in this plan and what the Godhead did to bring about this salvation. But I look at it now and, and I delight. I see the beauty and the glory. It isn't nodding your head to something and coming to church a couple times a year. It's looking at this and seeing the beauty of what we just looked at. And I delight and what God has done in his son to bring about my salvation. To believe the gospel and to trust, I'm pleased in God's satisfactory work and salvation. It's finished. To, to rest, the burnt offering, you would come and you would confess your sins and just lean upon that offering. You would rest on it. And, and it's the same word now is that we rest in Christ. We look at what he did and I'm going to bank everything on it. I'm going to bank eternity. I'm going to take deep delight in the son of God who died for my sins to where now I offer up my life to him. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe this. I'm going to rest in it. I'm going to lean on it. I'm going to trust and as a pastor, I've gone to too many deathbeds and watched people breathe their last and go to glory believing this, but I've seen those who have died without Christ. And you sit here this morning, and maybe your greatest concern is paying your bills, uh, your health. There's many things that you're battling this morning, but I'm telling you, when you are about to breathe your last breath and the ventilator's going up and down, this is going to matter more than anything else. Your possessions, your wife, your goals, your ambitions, they're going to melt. What's going to matter is that Jesus Christ came into this world and he bore the wrath of God for your sins so that you could be forgiven. And he was put in a grave and they came to the grave and it was empty because he was raised. He's been raised to bring about our salvation. And God said, I'm pleased. I'm satisfied with what he did. There is salvation in no other name. And so I pray that you would look to Jesus Christ for your salvation. I close with just one of the great fairy tales of all time, and it, it flooded my mind again when I studied this some time back, and it's that old, that old fairy tale of Beauty and the Beast. I, I hope you've seen it. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, there's this man marred beyond recognition, and he's appalling to look at the beast. And many of us sit here feeling this way. If people saw who I truly was, that they'd be appalled. I put on a front fake. I try to do, look good to the world, but I, I know what I am every time I put my head on that pillow. And so we spend all of our days trying to create a beauty for other people to see. And we spend all kinds of time and effort and money on our appearance. We might spend it on our education, our possessions. We try to create a beauty because we feel ugly on the inside. And Beauty and the Beast, Belle Kisses the beast. Am I getting them mixed up? Is it Bell? You, you can, um, you're probably on to me. I don't do a lot of these things. <laughs> but Bell kisses the beast, and it transforms him, and it saves him, and it makes him beautiful. In Isaiah 53, Jesus took it one step further. 
Jesus had to become a beast. And he was disfigured where people turned their heads and he was marred like no other human. And he did this so that you could become a beauty where God could look at you and say, you're justified this morning. I see you as if you lived the life that Jesus lived and you died the death that Jesus died. And I justify you. You are a beauty before God this morning by what Jesus Christ did. It's the only remedy for what you're feeling. And we are to live upon this. And this is how we now become more and more beautiful in our practice. The more and more we behold this gospel and what God has done for us, he's made us beautiful by his doing. And it's right standing before God and he's changing us from one image of glory to the next. And I was just thinking for our visitors, I shepherd a church with the people who used to worship the devil, some drug addicts, sex addicts, religion addicts who grew up in the church trying to be good and judged everybody. We got people who have come from all walks of life who have called upon the name of Jesus Christ and been healed and been justified. And they're being changed from one image of glory to the next, my family the family of God, his, his posterity that he rejoiced in, that you guys would be that. And so I invite you to come to Jesus Christ no matter what your past is, no matter what you've done, no, believing that God can't forgive you. He, he can because he didn't forgive his son. There's nothing you could do too bad because his son bore it on Calvary. You don't sit in a lie saying I'm too bad or that I'm too good. If you're too good, Jesus wouldn't be hanging on a cross in your place. He's the answer for good people and bad people, for prostitutes and for religious people. Jesus Christ is able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. The way is through the cross and his resurrection. By his resurrection, we are healed and we join in all the booty of having every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so to God be the glory for the risen Son of God that makes this salvation certain. And so I close as we do every Easter. And I, I, wanna, I want you to say it a little louder than normal because I'm so fired up about what God has done. Don't, don't say like, just, he's risen indeed. <laughs> he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen to God be the glory for a risen Savior. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that it's the only death. All these religious leaders, you go in their tombs, have dead, decaying bodies. And our Savior has been risen from the dead because he conquered death. And he is a Savior from death and sin and condemnation. God, we praise you. We join corporately as the family of God with hearts full because of a full Christ who gives a full salvation and a Father who's fully satisfied and pleased. God, thank you for this gospel. And I pray if there's any who need this Jesus Christ that they would come even this morning, that they would believe in the one who died on that cross and was raised. God, let them not look to their merit, to their goodness, to their own self-justifications through life. God, let them gaze now by faith upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be healed. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.